gathered together with God's people? Amen. Have you ever had news that just had you bursting at the seams? You just wanted to, had to tell somebody. You had to tell everybody. Maybe the first time you're going to be a parent, you're so excited. You just told everybody you've seen. Grandparents never talk about their grandchildren, do they? No. <laughs> never. It's exciting. Maybe you got the big promotion at work. Maybe you got your dream house. Exciting news you want to share with people. Some things are just too exciting to keep in. What about the good news of Jesus? Think about that. That's what we need. Our scripture reading from Ephesians chapter 2 and verse four through, verses 4 through 8 says, But because of his great love for us, God, who is rich in mercy, made us alive with Christ, even when we were dead in transgressions. It is by grace you have been saved. And God raised us up with Christ and seated us with him in, in the heavenly realms in Christ Jesus. In order that in the coming ages, he might show the incomparable riches of his grace expressed in his kindness to us in Christ Jesus. For it is by grace you have been saved through faith. And this is not from yourselves. It is the gift of God. Salvation is the most exciting gift we will ever receive, bar none. Because that is the only gift we'll take with us from this earth. It has more value than anything else that we have, that we own, that we possess. And so when we have that and we get that, we should be bursting at the seams to tell people about that. Our lesson title tonight is Exciting Salvation. Because when we think of salvation, it should be exciting. It should elicit joy and desire. Tonight, I want to look at, at some people who was excited about the prospects of salvation. First of all, the woman at the well was excited about Jesus in John chapter 4. Not so much when she first met him, but as the conversation went on. And it started with a simple question. John 14, 7. When a Samaritan woman came to draw water... Jesus said to her, Will you give me a drink? Now, we know that Samaritans and Jews didn't get along. They didn't speak, let alone drink from the same vessels. So, yeah, it was a shock to the woman when Jesus even spoke to her, let alone ask for a drink. I mean, this was really out of the ordinary. But Jesus engages her in a conversation. Jesus talks to her about the water she's drawing, about him being the living water, about anybody that drinks water from him will never thirst again. That intrigued her interest. She says, give me some of this water. And so he begins to have a conversation with her. Her interest is sparked, and, and she wants to continue that conversation with Jesus. In John chapter 4 and verse 15, the woman said to him, Sir, give me this water so that I won't get thirsty and have to keep coming here to drink water, to draw water. Now, you see, she had the right idea. Jesus, give me this water. But she was thinking in terms of physical water. Give me some of this so I won't have to come here and draw water again. And that's one of the problems that people have when we hear something that's out of the ordinary, we immediately get an idea in our mind of what it is or what we think it should be. And that's what that woman thought. Oh, great, a water that I could drink and, and never be thirsty again. And I won't have to come here and draw water. And obviously that's not what Jesus meant. He's talking spiritual. He uses this opportunity to give her a taste of what he has to offer. He talks to her about her life. He talks to her about the difference between the Samaritans and the Jews. 
He reminds her that there is another way and there is going to be a better way of worship. And she starts getting excited. She starts getting interested. When he reveals to her that he knows about her life, and now her eyes are really open, gets to the point where they come down to the point where Jesus reveals himself as the Messiah, and she is excited. She says, yeah, we know, and we're waiting on the Messiah. And Jesus says, I who you speak to am. I am the Messiah. He shows her his ability to know people's hearts, to know their desires. And she begins to sense in her mind that this man she's speaking to, this Jesus, is someone special. And it begins to work on her heart. It begins to work on our mind. In verses 28 and 29 of John chapter 4, it says, Then leaving her water jar, the woman went back to town and said to the people, Come see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? This may not seem out of the ordinary, but we have to remember <coughs> that she's at the well about noon when Jesus is there. She's the only one coming out to draw water. Because of her reputation in town, she was kind of an outcast of society. And so she did always have to go at an off time when the rest of the women weren't there drawing water. But now she's got this exciting news, and she wants to go back into town and share it. She don't care what people think of her. She don't care what her reputation is. She's got something exciting that she wants to share. And so she gets excited and she runs back into town with getting the water, which is the whole reason she was out there anyway. And she told him, come and see a man who told me everything I ever did. Could this be the Christ? And her excitement intrigued the people of Samaria. Her excitement got them interested. They came out and Jesus spoke to them to the point where the citizens finally turned to the woman and said, look, we don't believe in this guy because of you anymore. We believe because of what he said. So they got excited. They got excited and they were all ready to hear more. That's the way we need to feel about salvation because it's a great gift that everybody needs. We just need to introduce people to Jesus. Someone else that was excited about salvation was the demon-possessed man. It was Cotless. The demon came and kneeled before Jesus. Think about that. They go to this area, and there's this man living amongst the tombs. Nobody could bind him. He wouldn't keep clothes on. He ran around screaming and hollering, breaking chains. But when Jesus approached, Mark chapter 5 and verse 6 says, When he saw Jesus from a distance, he ran and fell on his knees in front of him. This demon recognized Jesus and knew his power. Think about that. This demon that was all out powerful in his physical body knelt before Jesus. There wasn't a man that, that could contain him, that could stop him. They'd put chains on him. He'd break them. What would stop him from going up to Jesus and trying to break him? Verse 7, Mark 5 says, He shouted at the top of his voice, What do you want with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? Swear to God you won't torture me. This demon, or these demons, I should say, they knew God and they knew his power. They knew that he had the ultimate power. They could do nothing to overcome God. And so when they came to Jesus and recognized who he was, they bowed before him. They acknowledged his power. 
You know, knowing that a demon had had all this strength that's within this body, how should we react to the power of Jesus? How should we look at Jesus and see him? We should be excited about the fact that we belong to Jesus. We've been washed in the blood, and we need to tell people about it. We need to live it. People need to see it in the way we live. The demon requested that Jesus not torture him. He knew he had that power. He knew he could do whatever. So the demons requested that Jesus send the men to the herd of swine that was over in the other field. And Jesus obliged. This is a display of the compassion of Jesus. Jesus could have easily said, no, you don't have any right to ask me not to do that. You're a demon. You don't follow me. You, you don't help my cause. You're against me. So Jesus could have very easily said, no, I'm going to torture you. But Jesus said, go ahead. Go ahead. Go into the swamp. And of course, we know that once they got into the swine, what happened? They all ran down the hill and jumped off the cliff and drowned. Notice that not everyone was excited about the presence of Jesus in that area. I mean, at, to us as modern day Christians, that shocks us, doesn't it? To think, how could people not be excited that, that Jesus is in their hometown? That Jesus is right there. They got access to him. They can go up and they can touch him. They can talk to him. But in Mark chapter 5 and verse 17, it says, Then the people began to plead with Jesus to leave their region. And it caused fear in the people in that region. And this still happens today. Some people get afraid when they witness the power of God. Instead of embracing it and allowing God to, to change them and mold their life, they get, they get scared. And they turn away. They want Jesus to leave. Well, remember, even Peter said, go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. He recognized the holiness and greatness of Jesus and realized he wasn't even close. But see, Jesus doesn't want us to come to him when we get holy and get righteous, when he wants us to come to him to become that way. He wants to rescue us from the sin, wants to rescue us from the pit that we put ourselves in. He doesn't tell us, once you climb out of that pit, you can come to me. He says, reach out your hand and I'll fight you out. I'll direct you. I will guide you. So I believe the people here at Decapolis, that was probably their big problem. They knew they were sinful and they had witnessed a, a power that they had never witnessed before. So instead of embracing him, instead of inviting him to teach them more, they said, leave. We don't want you here. We don't want to be part of this. But the man who was cleansed <laughs> was eager to follow Jesus. The man who truly experienced the power of God, he was excited. The demons had been cast out. He was a whole different person. He sat down and he ate. And he begged Jesus to let him join him. To go out and minister with him. To be one of his disciples, one of his apostles. Let me go with you. And you'd think this would be a, a great thing. To take this man who all these demons were cast out of. And as you're preaching to people, you can show this is one of the examples. This man was possessed. This man was evil. This man could not be contained. But now, look at him. Look what the power of God has done. But Jesus, Jesus says, no, you can't go with me. What you need to do is to stay right here and go back into town and tell everybody what you've seen. And tell everybody about the power. Tell everybody about the kingdom. Now, this is kind of odd 
you know, we're told in Scripture that a prophet has no honor in his hometown. And I'm sure people have experienced that. They've maybe been ornery in their earlier life. Somewhere along the line, God gets to their heart. They get excited about their salvation. And eventually they come back to their home area and they start talking to people about Jesus. And people kind of raise their eyebrows and say, yeah, I remember you. I remember who you were. I remember the things that you have done. Now, don't come to me and start talking to me about righteousness. Because that's the way people are. You know, because people don't want to change. They don't think anybody else can. And this man probably understood that to a point, but he also just was so excited about Jesus, he wanted to go with him. But Jesus said, stay here. Because people know who you are here. They know how wicked and evil you were. Look how surprised they would be when you can sit down and have a conversation with them and you're not looking to kill them. You're inviting them to be who you have become. Verse 20 of Mark chapter 5 tells us, So the man went away and began to tell the Decapolis how much Jesus had done for him. And all the people were amazed. They all were amazed. And sometimes we get to a point where people say, I knew you, but now, but now look at you. I often wonder what Charles Colson went through in his personal life. If you know Charles Colson, he wrote many, what he did, right? He wrote many, many spiritual books, many books on how we can change and how we can follow Jesus. But if you remember way back in the 1970s, Charles Colson was on Nixon's team, and he went to jail for Watergate. So can you imagine being part of Richard Nixon's inner circle, then going to jail because of what happened at Watergate, and then coming out and trying to get people to listen to you tell about Jesus? Had to be a hard road to go. It had to be a tough path. But he continued at it. He has become one of the most famous, if nothing else, authors on the Christian faith. Now, I'm not saying everything he taught was in line with the Bible, but he was very influential in people's lives. But even when you look at his past, and he was an adult when that past happened, it wasn't like he was a teenager. But he overcome it by the power of God, and he was eager and excited to tell people about it. The early disciples were excited about Jesus. Andrew, one of the first disciples that was called, he was so excited that the first thing he did, he went out and found his brother. John chapter 1, verse 41, the first thing Andrew did was to find his brother Simon and tell him, we have found the Messiah, that is, the Christ. So when Jesus called Andrew, which had been one of John's followers, it says the first thing he did went out and found Simon. We have found the Christ. We have found the Messiah. Come and meet him. Be part of it. It's so exciting. John had told Andrew and another of the disciples that Jesus was the Lamb of God. And the two started following Jesus. Do we share the same excitement as Andrew? That when we discover Jesus, that we want to tell everybody? We want to bring our family along? We want to bring our friends along? We want them to meet Jesus and feel the same excitement we feel. And sometimes today, not all the disciples are near as excited. No, I'm not going to say it's boring. But do they get excited like the early disciples did to try to draw people 
Philip was excited to introduce Nathaniel to Jesus. Man, you can almost hear the excitement in, in Philip's voice. After Jesus calls Philip, he immediately went to include Nathaniel in this joy. In John chapter 1, verse 45, it says, Philip found Nathaniel and told him, we have found the one Moses wrote about, Jesus of Nazareth, the son of Joseph. I mean, you can almost hear the excitement in his voice as, he, as he's talking to Nathaniel. We found the Messiah. We found the one Moses has wrote about. We found Jesus. He was excited. I can imagine his heart was racing. You could just hear the excitement in his voice. He's probably animated. Nathaniel sitting there leaning against a big tree. And he wasn't near as excited as Philip at first. What was Nathaniel's response? Can anything good come out of Nazareth? <laughs> that was his response. But Jesus, Jesus came and met Nathaniel face to face. And Jesus spoke to him. Nathaniel's still not overly convinced. But Jesus tells him, there he is, an Israelite of Israelites. A man in whom there is no dishonest, dishonest bone in his body. And then he mentioned seeing him under the fig tree earlier. Now all of a sudden, Nathaniel's thinking, And he went before Jesus and he bowed his head. He became excited too. It took him a minute, but he became excited too. The early church. Ah, where'd that come from? <laughs> we just missed the last point probably. The early church was excited about what Jesus had done. The early church was excited. In Acts, we read how the church is growing, how the church dedicated themselves to the teaching of the apostles. They prayed together. They ate together. They worshiped together. They visited together. They went out together. They took care of everyone's needs. They were excited about being part of the family of God. In that early church from Acts chapter 2 up to about Acts chapter 6, 7, things were going really smooth. People were excited and they were gaining honor with God and with people. And then, and then, the public kind of started coming against the church. So, and finally, in Acts chapter 8, in verse 4, it says, Those who had been scattered went and preached the word everywhere they went. You know, when Jesus had told the early disciples, You are going to be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and Samaria and all the ends of the earth. And so here where the church was in Jerusalem, gaining favor with God and with man, they were enjoying what they were doing. They liked having that favor and being able to touch those people in Jerusalem. But they were forgetting the rest of the Great Commission. They were forgetting that Jesus had told them, you got to go into all the world. You're going to be my witnesses not only here in Jerusalem, but in Judea, but in Samaria, and all the ends of the earth. And they were forbidden about all the ends of the earth. And so the persecution came. And I believe it came from God. And he scattered the church. But that didn't dampen their spirits. Everywhere they went, what they do? They preached the word. They 
were still excited. Even though they'd been ran out of their hometown and they had lost everything, more or less, because of this persecution, only the apostles stayed back in Jerusalem. But all the church was scattered. And they were still excited about Jesus. And they preached to people. Now Jesus promised us more of a hard road to travel than a smooth one. He promised there would be people that would be against us. But Paul proved and even talked about when you have the right attitude, it doesn't seem like a rough road. We look, read Paul's life when he converted. He had it rough. He went through things we wouldn't dream of going through. He went through things that many Christians, once they went through the first one, they'd be done. kept going and didn't think anything about it because he knew what the destination was and he knew whatever he went through on this earth couldn't even touch what the destination was that that would be so much greater than any suffering he was present so it was all in the attitude you know this present life can be blessed Richly, just by being faithful, regardless of what's happening around us, regardless of, of what people say, of what people do, God will continue to bless us in this life. But the next life, however, living eternally with God is what the real excitement is all about. Being with God, getting that eternal reward, and knowing we heard when we get there, well done, my good and faithful servant. And we can go through this life and we can live a godly life. We can be a light shining bright in a dark world and never, ever, 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 ever baptize anybody. But God doesn't hold that against us because that's not our job. Our job is to plant the seed and water. God gives the growth. So as long as we live this life that's the example that's planting seeds and watering seeds, God says, well done, my good and faithful servant. Well done. Because that's our job. As long as we're excited about who we are as Christians, God will bless us. Friends, salvation is exciting. It's exciting because of what the results are. It's exciting because it's one thing that every soul needs. And we have it, and we can give it away for free and not lose any involvement. We need to be excited enough to tell everybody. We've been given a great many blessings in our own life. Our methods of travel and communication are all equal to that of any other time in history. I mean, it hadn't been all that long ago or it was a whole lot more difficult to jump in the family vehicle and drive cross country. But we could do that. I mean, with, with the internet, when it worked, <laughs> you could get on your computer and send a message around the world in seconds and reach many, many people. You don't even have to buy a stamp. We have completed copies of God's Word available in many languages. You know, in the New Testament times, at first only the rich had copies of the Scriptures. And then they were only partial. Everybody needs what we have. Everybody needs a Savior. Everybody needs salvation. And it should excite us that we can play a role in that by merely being who God wants us to be. By just stepping up and, and trusting in God. So let us be excited to share the good news. And let us be excited enough that we live it every day. And when people see us, they see that excitement. And they see that we're, we're glad to be who we are. And they can have that joy in their life too. Jesus calls us all the time to come to him because as Christians
and sometimes we do feel overburdened. We do feel like we're overwhelmed. We feel like the world is in control. But God is in control, and he invites us to take the yoke of Jesus and let Jesus lead us. Jesus said he's gentle and humble in heart. And you will find rest for your souls. Maybe you need to find that rest tonight. Maybe you need to get that excitement back that you felt when you first became a Christian. Maybe you just need God to spark that fire a little bit. You can do that tonight by responding to God and telling Him you want to follow Him and you want to take on the yoke of Jesus. Because you know it's easy, you know it's light. If you need the prayers of the church for any reason, you can come forward and we will lift you up to God. We'll stand there as we sing. Line on nine. Please line on nine. There's a fountain stream.